Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I am going to talk to you about the science of fertilization. The word simply means applying fertilizer through irrigation. Most of you know this. And many of you have been doing this for the last uh, several years. But fertigation, to do it correctly, precisely, to assist precision farming, there are certain steps we have to follow. And some of these steps are operational, some of the steps are theoretical. And these operational steps, we can teach, train the farmers to do it or the technicians to do it. But the theoretical step has to be done prior to the operational steps by the, uh, the provider company. That is why a drip irrigation company, a large drip irrigation company like Jane Irrigation, employs a number of people who are qualified to do this. And the company calls them agronomists. These agronomists are supposed to know the basics about plant nutrition and uh, the entire science of fertigation. Today, using few slides, I will be going through that basic part of it, a bit on the operation side, mostly on the, uh, the theoretical side, how the fertigation is finally made to work in the field. I will not be touching much upon the equipment side because my colleagues in January have already uh, covered many of the things. I would be just uh, touching upon things only. But this will be, we are talking about plant nutrition, the nutrients, then what provides the nutrients, then what actually required for uh, fertigation, or mainly the water-soluble fertilizers. And the man, major issue is that what is happening to Indian soils? by our continuous use of chemical fertilizers and uh, flow irrigation. Then I touch upon the very important topic called fertigation scheduling. When to apply fertilizer, how much to apply, and what mineral to apply. And then I will be showing some research which uh, we have done in Jain irrigation as well as in collaboration with others. Now, if you come to plant nutrition, plants requires a number of elements of this carbon and uh, oxygen and hydrogen is available in plenty in the nature carbon very limited in the soil i'll come to that later the fertilizer elements which farmers usually apply and the plant crop requires generally are nitrogen potassium and phosphorus and the slide shows the condensed is required if you have uh, 30 gram of nitrogen per kg in the a plant that which means it is having sufficient like that phosphorus four kg four gram per kg it is sufficient and there are a lot of other elements which we call the secondary elements as well as the uh, the uh, micro elements which comes together about 26 gram per kg this is what it is but the, whatever i said it's only a theory part of it it doesn't make any sense in the practical sense now these nutrients which i listed already are applied as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and secondary element, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And the crop takes it up nitrogen as nitrate or ammonia. Phosphorus as um, S2PO4 and SPO40, orthophosphate. Potassium as potassium ion, K plus ion, and like that. Now, if you take a large, large number of plants and uh, during their growth and analyze, especially those growing with a sufficient nutrition, you will see the macronutrient concentration when it is sufficient in the crop for its growth and development. Nitrogen comes about 2.5 to 4.5 is the percentage. Phosphorus about 0.2 to 0.75, potassium 1.5 5.5. If you look at potassium, it's actually highly utilized. Large volume, large contents of potassium is utilized. Sulfur 0 0.25 to 1, calcium 1 to 4, and magnesium 0 0.25 to 1. These are the major primary nutrients and the secondary nutrients. Then we come to micronutrients. And in fact, uh, many people 
working in agriculture, I mean, farmers don't sometimes don't even know that their crop requires micronutrient because the old pressure put on to the farmers to use NPK, NPK and NPK, all of that. So, but there are certain elements with small amounts. So that's why it is listed in PPM in the slide, parts per million or milligram per liter, or on, for example, 10 to 200 PPM, very according to various various crops, fluoride, 100 to 500, copper, iron, 100 to 500, manganese, molybdena, very, very small quantity, points, one to two ppm and zinc and many of you who have grown are uh, growing rice would know that zinc and iron are very critical for the uh, the crop growth so we have two types now here when you start a crop nobody knows after doing everything right you still may not get the potential yield of that crop one of the main reason if you don't if you don't have insect or pest attack or uh, things which are biological then the major reason why the crop is not coming to its full yield potential is obviously shortage of some element and so long back this law of limiting factors was coined if you look at the two cylinders i see i have given we are talking about tomato yield in the cylinder on the your right side and my left side you see it gets about 13 tons per hectare very low yield of tomato for that matter and then you see the from the tank the water water is coming out at the lowest point and the lowest point is potassium which means why the yield cannot why that tank cannot hold more yield is because potassium is less so the tank is not complete it is leaking there so in other words the crop cannot grow so potassium is actually limiting there and you go to the next uh, the other side where of course we applied potassium then we found at a later stage magnesium becomes uh, limited so what i'm trying to say is that we may provide every nutrition element to the crop from time to time but still there will be a hidden hunger which we may not know unless we analyze the plant and find out what is actually happening while it is why it is not growing or while it is not is not giving enough yield or its targeted yield this may be due to the hidden hunger of any one element may the primary secondary or even micronutrients which became limited because of its absence throughout the crop's life or part of the crop's life now, this is what has to be done. So here, to identify what is exactly lacking in a growing crop, one has to take the tissue, especially the leaf tissue, and do the analysis and find out. But then many of them cannot do that. There are ways of understanding this by looking at the external symptoms, which for a trained eye, it's possible to find out whether potassium is limiting. But another thing I have to highlight here is that when you see a limitation externally expressed, the damage due to that limited is already done. So we cannot, if a potassium deficient plant, we saw most of the leaves burning at the uh, yeah, yeah, yes. And later we just go and apply some potassium. We may not be able to recover the full yield. So balancing comes from the original soil analysis and finding out what is lacking in my field. Now, how are we going to give this fertilizer? nutrients to the crop nutrients are through fertilizers when i say fertilizers don't jump to the conclusion that i'm talking about urea potassium and all that fertilizers are can be any substance they contain one or more recognized plant nutrient like nitrogen phosphorus calcium magnesium or iron or like that these condense and it is claimed to have when you are testing these material these should produce growth in the plant. They should promote growth. Then only it becomes a fertilizer. If you put something, somebody said something to put it, you'll get it. If it is not promoting growth and the development, it is no longer a fertilizer. Now let us classification. These are information, you already know it, but 
to tell you a whole story, I need to touch upon them. There are fertilizers, organic types, plant origin type, biological fertilizers. Yeah. Inorganic type, then bio fertilizers, organisms, small organisms, algal, fungal, mycorrhizal. These are bio fertilizers. Organic manures, we all know FOIM, very bulky, but their nutrient content will be less, but they add a lot of roughage, which is basically mainly carbon and all that to the soil. You have compost, you have concentrated ones in that, oil cakes, neem oil cake, castor oil cake, even blood, animal blood from the abattoir is a uh, manure only. Green manures, we grow sometime before harvest, after harvesting one crop, before we go into the thing, the second crop, in the interim, we take about uh, two months, three months, or even one month, a crop like the sunham, and many of the pulses like cowpea or green manure. They add in nutrients to the soil. That's why they're called green manure. Now we classify, we have nitrogenous fertilizers, urea ammonium sulfate, you have phosphatic, single superphosphate is a well-known fertilizer used in India. You have potassium fertilizers, which is potassium MOP, muriate of potash, or SOP sulfate of potash. Then you have a lots of complex fertilizers. These are complex in the factory. You are not doing it your own. DAP, diammonium phosphate, monoammonium phosphate, potassium nitrate, monopotassium phosphate. These are some of them. Then you have micronutrients, which are it comes as uh, zinc sulfate, borax, iron sulfate, and all that. Then you you have you have a series of non fertilizer. But chemicals added to the soil as soil amendments, gypsum, when we add, when you have a high alkalinity in the soil, we add gypsum. Then we have biofertilizers, which are organisms, as I said, acetobacter, rhizobium, and uh, phosphorate solubilizing bacteria, which is uh, 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 coming in the uh, series of single celled uh, biofertilizers. Now, let us look at there are straight fertilizers for our knowledge, because urea is a straight fertilizer, it just contains nitrogen. Then the phosphate, superphosphate contains phosphate. Main, main element is uh, uh, phosphorus. It also contains some sulfur. Then you have muriate of potash, which is potash. Then complexes are there, different complexes are available. 18, 18, 10, 10, 26, 26, 17, 17, 17, very popular. Then you have mixed ones, where DA picks mixed by, uh, plus urea at certain point. Now, the important thing is that all the fertilizer we apply in large quantities into the field do not have only mineral used for, by the crop. So fertilizers have something called a carriers. See, for example, urea, it has only 46.4% nitrogen. Ammonium sulfate, 20% nitrogen. Calcium ammonium nitrate, 15% nitrogen. Then you have phosphatic, superphosphate 16 percentage, muriate of potash 60 percentage, bacteria potassium nitrate, zero forty-six units of nitrogen, and 46 units of, of uh, uh, potash. Yes. So these are the fertilizers farmers are familiar with, and they have been using year after year. And we call them for this discussion part, we call them conventional fertilizers. Because I'm going to talk about something else later, which are not so conventional. Usually, we apply two or three splits during the crop cycle life cycle. They, when they were, when we are applying, we apply large quantities, like 50 kg, or in the farmer's language, two bags, which is 100 kg, like that. And these are not completely water soluble. Usually, fertilizer is applied. Then irrigation, flow irrigation follows that actually to make the fertilizer dissolve in water, ionize it into minerals in the plant absorbable form. There is a process going on in the soil at that. And many of these fertilizers contain sodium and chloride, which are not at all preferred to be there in the soil much, but they harm the plants. And uh, resultant to the, all these method of application of uh, dry fertilizer into the soil and then irrigation, or that we do not get a uniform distribution across the different parts of the field. So there is no uniformity. And placement is also not correct. Fertilizer may be lying somewhere, the roots and the root hairs, which absorb the fertilizer, are somewhere else. Okay. And chemically, there is another issue. Fertilizers like the phosphorus and potassium, they get fixed chemically bound to 
chemicals in the soil and they may not be able to come out of it. Potassium, for example, not only to chemically, they get bound by clay elements, the clay lattice structure. That's why when you apply too much potassium, most of them goes for fixation. It's not available to the crop. crop. And the resultant of the, all these fixation and uh, non-utilization by the crop instantly of the applied fertilizer, the soil deteriorates. You make the soil more salt loaded or saline. And if we get about 30 or 40 or 50 percent fertilizer use efficiency. Under kg you apply, you get worth of 40 kg. And the another thing about the conventional fertilizers, they are made in such a way into complex molecules. Their nutrients are not easily available to the crop. And many of them have pH, which is more than 7, 7.5, which means they are turning towards alkaline. And when there are large chunks of Indian soil, central Indian soils, states, are all alkaline soils. So you are adding to the alkalinity. And there is another interesting thing. Urea is much, most commonly used. You, later you will see that. How disproportionately we are using urea. And in case of urea, nitrogen is lost if your water management is flooding the field. And it also lost volatilization if you don't irrigate on time because urea as such will get uh, evaporated. And then it also goes by leaching down. One of the major thing with these fertilizers and the conventional mode of applied splitting 3, 4 is that these fertilizer application timings and the crop demand, peak demand timings would have no parallel, no relationship at all. People are applying some basic thing, then after 15 days or after one month or after two months, they do that. This is basically purely on a calendar basis and not on the crop's growth stage basis. This is one of the major disadvantages actually created fertilizers not giving the potential yield. In India. Now let us look at our soils, some of the look at some history of this and our way of nutrient addition. Nutrient addition. Now, this is a very, very frightening map for a person who is in the field of agriculture, the farmer or a scientist. It's actually done by Coromandel uh, in their internal work. They took about 3.4 lakh samples of soil and analyzed for organic carbon, what we call in our soil test, OC. You see, just to summarize it, states like West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, Punjab are extremely poor, the soils are, for carbon. Now you may ask me, why do we need carbon? I have urea, I, I keep on adding urea. Please understand, even the urea's nitrogen availability to the crop happens only if there is sufficient organic carbon in the soil. There is something called a carbon to nitrogen ratio which you have to maintain. When you add more urea, you are getting more nitrogen and proportionately lesser carbon crops will have to suffer. Now, to summarize it, 67 percentage of Indian soils have very low organic carbon. Very low organic. This is actually a a very frightening uh, thing for the Indian agriculture. Now we look at the deteriorating balance of NPK. NPK have to be at certain balance, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that we apply. But look at this data. Over a period of time, we were having 4.32 is to 1 NPK around 2010. Just in three years, this is some data from the um, uh, government website, Agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture, Union Government. It has moved to almost a double nitrogen, but P has not doubled. P has 3.2, and sadly, K is sitting with one. So basically, what happens is that farmers, because of the availability issue as well as the cost issue, they buy with the cheapest fertilizer, which happened to be urea, compared to potash. And they keep on adding because their belief is that give this more, you get more. It doesn't happen. It not only doesn't happen in terms of yield, it deteriorates the soil. And this nitrogen, excess nitrogen, as nitrate, will get washed through the running water from the field to field, finally end into your water channels, your lakes, 
rivers and sometimes and also because the leaching it gets in your groundwater so it only spoils it pollutes soil it pollutes water and that is another reason why we get low productivity per unit fertilizer i will show you that also now we look at this efficiencies i'm talking about nutrient efficiency nitrogen has got 30 to 40 percent efficiency only where are the other amounts which we are applying they go to immobilize they get immobilized in the soil or part of them will get volatilized they they escape into the air denitrification takes place and the leaching takes place all these will remove that nitrogen from the root vicinity so plants can't take them phosphorus 15 20 one of the main problem with the phosphorus they get fixed with the aluminium ion calcium in the soil chemically fixed you cannot change it unless you go with the chemical reaction in the soil with acids which is uh, not do you can't do it in a crop field potassium 70 to 80 percentage that's slightly better in terms of efficiency but they also get into in clay soil they get into the clay lattices if you apply all this happens because you are applying too much quantity at one time that's a point it's not that whether you know how much is required for the crop you are assuming that if i give more at one time it will stay in the soil and the crop will take as and when it requires that doesn't happen sulfur immobilization leaching with water and a lot of micronutrients which also get fixed in soil now this is what i was trying then so what happened is that uh, from 1960 uh, 1970 to 2000 to the, again government study uh they have uh, plotted the response ratio of grain kilogram grains per kilogram in pk you saw that in 1970 we were in a reasonable comfortable position 13 point four kilogram of grain is produced per kg of NPK used but now less than 0.3.7 you're applying the same fertilizer you have the same land you might have divided the land into your son and daughter but the land is the same but the soil is not the same that's a problem the boundaries of the land the lay of the land everything will be the same but the soil is not so soil has gone from bad to worse situation so applying fertilizer and probably in, from 1972, 2010 or beyond 2020, I'm very sure farmers will be applying more fertilizer than probably what they applied in 1970 because their economic conditions improved. They can they have access and governments using the sun card and other loan facilities and all that governments are also providing and there's huge subsidy on the fertilizer. Fertilizer is available. So you keep adding more and more into the soil, but return. It's not so much. That's why the efficiency is becoming less. This is especially in irrigated areas. So finally, we come into by all these soil health issues, which has been an accumulated number of er error or fallacies or wrongdoings. Now, has depleted soil organic matter. That's why carbon is less imbalance in fertilizer and day by day the year by year the imbalance is increasing more towards nitrogen less towards others the emerging multi and then finally happened was that in many soils you have one or the other types of nutrient deficiencies iron deficiency zinc deficiency like that declining nutrient use efficiency which you already saw declining crop response ratio which means crop gives you less and less per unit fertilizer you apply this leads to the soils now if you look at it have a negative soil nutrient balance despite year by increase in adding nutrients to the soil this is something people with agriculture background and sense and even the administrators who are trying to develop indian agriculture to more precise more high productivity higher incomes and all that I have to really think about, about and find solution. From our small, we give one use optimal dose based on soil test. Now, here I give you a corollary. WHO has asked all the countries in the world increase test of coronavirus, increase test of people, test, test, and test. The same thing applies to your soil in agriculture. Do more tests. If you do a seasonal test before you start the crop, the crop which is very unlikely in india you do a better crop planning and fertilizer planning and fertilizer response you get 
at least do task every year one time a year you know your soil well how many of us are doing this how many farmers are actually taking governments have departments they have given they have taken this into notice and they have given a uh, lots of low cost uh, uh, testing methodologies and all that but how many farmers are actually testing their soil every season before they start planting before you start planting you must have a plan the fertilizer plan promotion I and mean, many yeah, this is what is most surprising thing to me many people feel if you are using chemical fertilizers nitrogen phosphorus and potash you need you can forget about the cow and the cow dung and that has created havoc in this country organic manure is required in the soil you saw the organic carbon graph i showed you it's impossible you cannot grow crop only with chemical inputs chemical nutrients you need to have these also contain chemical nutrients ultimately but they add a roughage they add carbon to the soil that's very important and then go for promotion of water soluble fertilizer that is connected to fertigation water soluble fertilizer small quantities more number of splits like three splits to 30 splits or four splits to 45 splits as you will see as i go along and promotion need based micronutrients how do you know the need the need is only by soil analysis and that's one uh, area where we are like lagging behind many people when they do the testing they test only npk maximum calcium and magnesium testing for micronutrients is very important for cropping especially at this stage of indian soils many of them we don't even know many of them have extremely poor content of micronutrients and there's no other way don't wait for the crop to show that that is something is uh, uh, deficient and somebody some expert comes and uh, wrongly diagnose it and you apply the wrong one it's also possible i'm not questioning them some of the symptoms may be the same for two elements i don't want to go into details on that so you need to promote need-based micronutrients which also comes from, from my number one point which is soil test do as much soil test as possible. Now I'm coming to another aspect of fertilizer. How do we apply fertilizer to the soil? Before planting, as well as after planting the crop. We have the good old method, the only method human beings know, take the fertilizer in the hand, throw it around, broadcasting. I know, even though it is good old and all that, even now, there are so many farmers I know of, cereal farmers, for example, are using that. You can see flat rice and this man, and a basket in his left hand, and taking with the right hand some fertilizer and spreading onto the flat water in a rice field. He is satisfied because he thinks that he applied, he spent money, he applied fertilizer but from the story so far you would have understood that fertilizer applied is not going to improve much they do a certain percentage 30 35 percent then we have a placement when the tractor mounted equipments came fertilizer applicator came they go in a dry soil with the plant standing and then apply by the side of the crop roofs, which is a placement, which is actually a better than far better than broadcasting. Then we have the foliar feeding. In special cases, foliar feeding, even during conventional agriculture, applications is applied. But now it is valuable, but only for correcting the deficiencies in certain cases where soil cannot provide or many mineral is available in the soil. But because of alkali conditions or pH conditions, it is not, plant cannot absorb in such cases. That's where foliar feeding comes in. Then we have through irrigation water, which is fertigation. Now, this is just a drawing. If you see the first one in this picture, the surface irrigation is applied to banana. And then fertilizer is already applied before irrigation. And that's how the irrigation, the fertilizer molecules, which I just put the color figures to show you, 
most of them are concentrated around that and some of them start moving along with the water movement please understand in a dry soil fertilizer cannot from the point of application cannot move anywhere they will just stay there so their farmers know that so they apply water up there so that's what it's up now many people have been with the drip irrigation for so many years now so initially years i remember interacting with farmers we give drip irrigation systems they use for irrigating they understand that and they don't use the fertilizer tank or the venturi they don't fertilize using that and it took some time now a lot of people a lot more people are doing that a lot more farmers are doing that they learned that then they apply fertilizer on the surface of the soil and drip irrigation even there what happens is that the fertilizer moves a bit with the irrigation which is coming later but the distribution in the rhizosphere in the root uh, mass what you call is not uniform it become localized then you have the final one drip fertigation where water carries small doses of fertilizer so much so that the water is not highly salinated that's a very important point you will learn it later as i go ahead and then as the water and the ions move around the soil it goes uniformly and reaches everywhere because the system is designed and irrigation schedules are planned and the emitting rates are well planned so much so that the water reaching the profile will only be restricted to the roots where there are the roots are there if anybody is wrongly doing excess irrigation that's a different matter in real in, in real sense of drip irrigation it doesn't water is not allowed to go beyond the absorbing root zone so that is where the fertilizer ions also get spread this is the best possible soil water fertilizer pattern we can create so irrigate with the drip also sprinkler for certain crops fertigate with them that's the point now this is just to go a bit into the theory see for example there is some root somewhere some fertilizer ions are located nitrogen can be taken by roots even if they are 20 mm away from the roots because the mobility in the soil with the water of nitrogen in normal case is higher when it comes to potassium it is lesser it is only it should be 7.5 mm close beyond that is not going to be taken up by the crop by the root when it comes to magnesium very heavy iron 5 mm and look at uh, phosphorus one of the laziest iron in the soil is phosphorus it refused to move at least in bullock carts when the bulls get tired they just lie and the, the you can see the owner trying to kick make sound and all that to get it up and move but phosphorus you can't do all these in the soil unless it is 1 mm close to the root hairs absorption don't that but hey, to some extent rhizobia works in this acts as a media to take the fertilizer uh, uh, be from a distant and bring to the thing if provided your crop root system and rhizobia are in a type of symbiotic relationship but that apart in the normal cases that's what is happening so there is a difference between the rate of movement of fertilizer nutrient downs in the soil and you can't do anything about that if you add water already pre added like in fertigation make a solution wherever the water moves the ions are automatically carried but if you put fertilizer in one side get the water later they go the concentrations will be difficult to control you don't have any control and their movement of that surface water through the soil profile you don't have any control either that is why when we talk about drip irrigation it is not the plastic tubes we are talking about and the drippers we are talking about the precision required for applying water and fertilizer so that the receptive roots will be happy to have them close to it now we come to water soluble fertilizers obviously fertilizers for fertigation that's a heading they have to be water soluble there is no doubt about it no question about it now there are you need to start with this technology we used to have liquid or fluid fertilizers that is fertilizer elements already dissolved 
and put in large containers and you take to the farm and you apply at a rate which is decided for the crop. But these fertilizers, they were the original liquid fertilizers, but they were difficult to carry, to transport to the farm, wherever you are making it from the factory. Then you have suspension fertilizers. They are fluid fertilizers. They have solid suspended onto the uh, fluid. These are not suitable in a way because the suspended ones will block your uh, emitters and the entire uh, systems. So finally, we have water soluble solid fertilizer. You can carry 20 gram, one gram, half a kilo in a bag, go to the drip system. If it is a fertilizer tank, make a solution in a bucket the proportions etc are given by the manufacturer of the fertilizer as well as by the um, system provider of the drip you can put that solution in the fertilizer tank or if it's a venturi put that bucket under the venturi tube suction tube you can get it down so this is probably the easiest technology has become easier and easier for field application now when you have you need to have certain requirements for the fertilizers. Any fertilizer cannot be used for fertigation. The first one is that high nutrient content in solution. When you're dissolving a small quantity of fertilizer in the solution, in the water, the nutrient content should be high. This is ensured in these specialized water soluble fertilizers. They are high solubility under field conditions. In a limited volume of water, you can put larger weight or larger volume of fertilizer. So that's what the solubility, I'll show you solubilities later. Then you have rapid dilution in the irrigation water is easier. You cannot put the fertilizer and wait for two hours to, to get the dilution done. Farmers don't use it. It's an instant solution they need. And main thing is that these fertilizers, when it is applied to the water, they should not, they should never clog the emitters because the purpose is defeated then. So you have, you should not have very insoluble material in the fertilizer and any conditioning agent which may precipitate, which may form froth or flakes should not be there. That is all characters associated with the fertilizer you're buying. And some of these fertilizers should be compatible with other fertilizers because there is a chance that you would be applying two at a time. You may have compatible with the irrigation water i will come back to that point the irrigation water is problem how it affects the fertilizer does not result in extreme you, the soils are already in bad i was giving you an example of uh, indian soils you have alkaline soils we get then seven more soils for example in madurai some of the sugarcane fields you can up to uh, seven nine eight okay what do you do with them you have to work and, and of course fertilizer that when in the water, the solution should not corrode the material through. What is good when soluble fertilizer is good? So, I some the, the first point, most important point, and it should be a percent water, and the solution should be pH low, as it because if the soil has got a problem, and correct. And, uh, is and the nutrient will be ready to be put in this already the sound started being around. And another thing is that many these water soluble do not in sodium and which the soil by some of in growth size and you can apply it possible you are applying on quantity and the precise application system is well, this carries water usually from to the other. These are also using small quantities in China and putting fish in the soil, either station or chemical. Because you are a small quantity, analyze water and that absorption. Because of the very Small or large day, the situation which you feel 
menyingkan ஒன்னா potassium nitrate and potassium sulfate these are the main water soluble fertilizers available now as i told you when these fertilizers have a ph which is less than 7 most of them are acidic urea pose uh, in pure urea when you get about 5 but many of the urea samples which you get in your diet is that the ph may be up to so anybody disagrees with me this is the reason they contain dirt they contain other things now ammonium sulfate which is very highly acidic fertilizer 5.5 we usually recommend it for all crops in the central indian alkaline belt map monopotassium phosphate 4.9 mono potassium phosphate 5.5 mono ammonium phosphate 4.9 and calcium nitrate which is 5.8 so phs are all under control the acidic phs now we have phosphoric fertilizer phosphoric acid 2.6 is one of the very good fertilizer it also cleans the when apply instead of acid injection into the drip system for declog clogging okay which you do if you are using phosphoric acid for fertigation that process it become two in one the other um, mkp and mkp as i was saying then you have potash fertilizers potassium chloride 46% and it has a ph 7 why the best is potassium nitrate and potassium sulfate it has got a lower ph uh 3.7 and mkp which is 5.5 now many people ask this question that's why i put this section what is the interaction of any fertilizer supposed to be water soluble fertilizer with water let me have a glass of water now the places where we have problems are when the water is hard that is its ec is very high there are places the tds the dissolved content of salts in the water is high that's what i have written chemical aspects of fertigation interaction with irrigation water the first that the first interaction can for it even in the soil so you have a high content calcium or magnesium bicarbonate and uh, high ph water there is a chance that some of the fertilizers especially phosphorus fertilizer sulfate fertilizer will get precipitated back when you are making the solution and calcium may form calcium carbonate just like so they are not but that you don't worry about there is a way to do this so recommended choose fertilizers that have an acid reaction because water is saline oh sorry water is alkaline high ph so you need to have a acid based fertilizer so like phosphoric acid mono ammonium phosphate which has got both nitrogen and phosphorus potassium phosphate which has got potassium and safer to use in hard water and in such cases we are also not recommending urea to be used because of some of these problem because the ph of the available samples of indian urea has got a higher relative higher ph than the pure urea i showed you then you, even after that after fertilizing or before fertilizing or well, fertigation you can inject acid into the system of the, and then remove all that is what has been precipitated before and uh, flush it through the drippers and apply fertigation that's also possible when you have calcium and magnesium 
containing fertilizer, you have to be extremely careful in the concentration, which of course the experts coming visiting your field will tell you how to apply, how much to apply. Now let us take another side type of water, saline water. There are places where water is saline. Please understand alkalinity is high pH. While salinity is, is high, will have sodium or chloride high chloride concentration so they are different actually so you cannot you can have alkaline or saline water also that's a different issue adding fertilizers in organic salts increases the yeast so yeast is already up it is two to three decimals amounts per meter square in other words yeast is more than two or three and into that you are adding inorganic salt fertilizers are inorganic salts what will happen the ec of the solution will even damage the crop so you have to be careful about it that's it now it is recommended in such what crop you are growing in saline area first of all that's where the first uh, uh, portion comes in you cannot grow a certain crop like a strawberry in a saline soil even banana sometimes in a high saline soil you cannot grow because the crop is not even happy with the soil forget about the application of fertilizer so that's the crop sensitivity to salinity. A lot of information is available. You ask, we can tell you. Choose fertilizers with a low salt index. Now, even this water, most of the water soluble fertilizers, when it is manufactured, they test the salt index. What is the salt index? That is, if you add a fertilizer, a certain quantity, into the soil solution, finally, it find, it water it comes from soil solution. It should not increase the osmotic pressure of the soil solution by the presence of the fertilizer. If it increases high, then that has a high salt index. The standard is given is actually sodium nitrate. It has got a uh, hundred as it's taken as the standard. And uh, for example, our urea will come about uh, hundred and uh, four, hundred and four. Okay, like. Uh, Potassium sulfate, very good fertilizer, very low salt load, comes only 46, which is far less than even the standard. So, in such cases, knowing that water is saline, the fertilizer chosen should have a low salt index. So, you don't make the salinity worse, you only try to improve the salinity, that's the principle. And then another thing that water, according to plant needs, and also you periodically flush the salts out of the system. This has actually been done in many of the saline uh, cultivation uh, uh, areas. Now, this crop susceptibility to salinity in the field in opal is huge buffering agent. Any non-conventional excess things, the soil has an ability to remove, absorb, and keep away from the plant. This is called buffering something excess it just apart but when you do greenhouse planting where you are using uh, aquaponics in water media or uh, you are using um, uh, aquaponics in, uh, artificial media and all that what happened the buffering capacity is not there yeah. so uh, this obviously a condition in uh, uh, cultivation and even there, you have to use low salt index fertilizers. Now we look at the solubilities. If you see that uh, you at uh, okay, solubility is something. How many grams of a salt of a fertilizer will dissolve without having anything, any sedimentation or any precipitate in the water? But it changes with the temperature. So you have to be the solubility in a tropical country like India, will be higher because we are experiencing higher temperature than in a temperate country in Europe, for example. So the temperature has to be noted. I have clearly given it's a 30 degrees centigrade. That's a normal ambient temperature. Uh, so you can dissolve up to 570 gram of urea in one liter of water. That is why in our fertigation recommendation, when we work with farmers, we say the reverse. We say one kg urea, you take it and two liter water, add it, you get a solution. 100% dissolved solution. That's what it is. Calcium nitrate, very highly soluble, 1,500 gram per solubility, like that. If you look at it, single superphosphate, which I put in red in the slide, 
170, single superphosphate in a way of speaking, it's not even soluble at all when you are uh, putting a lot of superphosphate in a large bucket of water. So it's not actually advised at all for fertigation. Diammonium phosphate is DAP, your favorite fertilizer, DAP, is not uh, recommended for fertigation. If anybody by mistake did it, they would have suffered their system having problems or not even suction that would take, take place. Potassium nitrate, potassium sulfate, these are all water soluble. Now what we call, is a standard uh, operating procedure, do a jar test. Many farmers sometimes even get, call me on my mobile and ask, sir, I got a new fertilizer from a supplier, some shop. It is white in color. It is granular, but it is powdery also, rough feeling. Can I use for fertigation? This is what it is, the question used to be. Now, in all such cases, even if you don't get a call also, if you get a new fertilizer, you before you venture into fertigation procedure, you do a jar test. You take a, a jar. If you don't have a jar, you take an empty bottle of aquafina or bisleri bottle. You put a spoon of fertilizer and add your irrigation water to fill it and shake it. Then look at the solution. If the solution has got any precipitate which comes to the top, or look for fibers moving around up and down the entire uh, uh, water, or anything floating, which is uh, low, no weight but it is floating on the top, or totally it became turbid, like in the rainy season, the rivers become turbid when the water and the mud comes from the hills, turbidity. Or some fertilizers will give a sediment at the bottom of that bottle. You look, sir, with a whitish ash color, something coming at the bottom. Or throughout it's, it's a milk color. Or muckiness, which is not the milk color, some other color, but it is dirty looking. What it means is that if within one or two hours these things develop, any of these things develop, that material given to you as water soluble fertilizer is not suitable at all for fertigation. That's the test. If you have two fertilizers at the same time, you have to do this jar test or the bottle test separately and then solutions you mix it and find out whether anything by mixing also creates any of the stability or uh, fibers or uh, precipitate. Producer. You have to have 100 percentage solution, complete dissolved. But your solution can have a color based on the salt you added, what fertilizer salt. Color has no problem, but turbidity has got a problem. Now I briefly touch upon fertigation equipment. As I said, my colleagues in drain irrigation have uh, uh, explained it very well. Normal, simple one acre, two acre farmers will have a system. This is of course the drip system. You are applying, you have here the well, then the pump, you have the hydrocyclone filter to remove sand, and then the water goes to the uh, sand filter if algae is there to remove. And before that sand filter entry, there's a small thing written, venturi, if you look at the slide very closely. That is the injection device. It's a simplest device used on the uh, used in small farms for injecting fertilizer, where you use the, bring the water in a bucket, make the solution in that bucket, and then put the suction tube of the venturi and supply to the system. This is the simplest. Now, these are the venturis. In chain irrigation, we have uh, from three quarters of inch to about two inch, two and a half inch venturis available. This is the way, it's a very crude way of sewing some color solution going up. Can see by adjusting the valve, which is written in this picture, you can create a vacuum at that red arrow shown in the on the top of the venturi, and uh, suction will start when you create a suction. It's exactly like you take a bottle of Coca Cola, you put a straw, and you suck it up. That is the way it works, but it works by manipulating the hydraulic pressure which is coming with the with the water in the system. That's a very simple, anybody can operate and less costly also. Then we have the fertilizer tank here. You prepare a solution and put in the tank, in the tank, and when you work with the throttle valve, water will, from the main line, water will come to the tank 
carry the fertilizer containing water and go to the system back again through the outlet. So fertilizer slowly moves with the water. This is why these two systems are the one which you see commonly in all farmers fields in India. But then when you have large farms and you need to do all this operation and also for climate control cultivation, you need to do the operation in large scale and more precision. And uh, in such cases, you can have what we call a Jain Nutri Care, which has a lots of facilities. Now, because this has also been dealt with in the previous webinar, I'm not going to do the details. These are basically a series of venturies which will take the water up solution of fertilizer from tanks, pre-prepared uh, solution from the tanks and supply to the system, very simple. It also has a checking device for the electrical conductivity and the pH of the solution. That is where I, I said in uh, greenhouse cultivation and large uh, climate control structures, where your precision on the EC and pH has to be extreme because you are growing some very high valuable crops but they are very sensitive to uh, small changes in uh, pH or EC. Then you can have these sort of systems. Here the EC and pH is monitored and there is one more device. If the, EC, if the pH is uh, not desirable, the system itself can take required amount of acid and put into the running solution. And here is where the automation comes in. So care and the automation system can work together. Now, basically, NutriCare is the fertigation machine, we call it. It is targeted to perform both irrigation and fertigation in uh, climate control uh, cultivation, like in greenhouses and in large open fields. And it has other applications. And basically, it's a bypass device. Water is passed from the main running into the system, such the fertilizer goes back to the system. That's what it is. It injects the nutrients and acid to the main line using venturi farms. But this is required, as I said, large management, uh, large uh, farms or climate controlled, high precision requiring farms. Now, the major topic, you may be thinking that why I keep talking like this, because fertigation is such a complex science. So it has several aspects. Now I'm coming to the software part. It's not so soft, though, the fertigation scheduling exercise. What does it mean by scheduling? You have fertilizer in your hand. You have an irrigation system working in the field. The farmer should know when I should apply a fertilizer, how much I should apply, and how often I should apply. This is the plan. That plan is pre-made for him by experts in the company, and we give it to him the fertilizer schedules in what we call the fertigation schedules in very simple language as you can see some of the uh, following slide what i'm going to show you now to do this for us for a person like me we need a lot of information beforehand to prepare the plant crop growing cycle what crop where which is the planting date and how many days it is going to grow what are the different stages of developmental stages coming as it grows in a cereal, for example, when does the boot stage come? When does the flag leaf will come? When does the tiller start? These sort of information we require. Crop growing cycle with the development stages and their duration. It's true with horticulture crops also. How the crop growth cycle is influenced by local climate. This is very important. Suppose I grow a particular variety of uh, tomato, say that in Tamil Nadu. Then I take this variety to Punjab and try to grow there, very soon you will find that their growth rate, developmental stages, everything changes because crops react. The only thing affecting crop growth rate when water, fertilizer, everything is sufficient is what we call the accumulated heat on a day, which is not temperature. When I say 40 degree, 20 degree, people misunderstand. It's actually what we call physiology we calculate the day decrease. There is an equation for that. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And only if sufficient day degrees are accumulated, 
a crop will change, change from one vegetative stage to the next vegetative stage or from vegetative stage to the reproductive stage. You might be finding it out very easily in the story of mango. For the last several years, if you have been experiencing mango or you are looking at mango flowering time, you would have seen a shift has happened. Mango from you are uh, 10 years back or mango 20 years back and mango now. They are not flowering on the same calendar date, not even the calendar month, not even the calendar week. They are pushed. Okay, this can be connected to climate change in the larger uh, uh, scenario and all that. I'm not going to go into that. So the accumulated degrees of heat on each day uh, will affect the growth rate. That is that we should know when we are going to make the fertigation plan. Then the amount of each nutrient required at each stage. This is also very difficult. We may know how much nitrogen uh, nutrient is required for um, uh, a crop like banana or a crop like sugarcane. But at each stage, what is the required? Then only you can have a matching application schedule. Then nutrient removal of the crop from the soil. This is also important. We do everything right and then we find out that some of the nutrients we apply to the soil, even through fertigation, the crop is not removing it because it, it, it found out something else is happening. This you will find out as I uh, go along how these are applied to make fertigation children. Now, a good fertilizer program takes into account the soil test. Again, we are coming to square one. I started saying, I even cited the WHO recommendation for coronavirus. Do test and test and test like that. Test and test and test your soil. We need to know what is available in the soil, then only we can add more. Crop growth and development and irrigation system, we should know. A well designed irrigation schedule and its effective management by the farmer. It will meet the property according to its uh, different differential need at different stages of growth. And you get that's what precision farming is. If you can make that happen, that's precision farming. You get high yield and high income. Okay, one of some data in India, basically the problem is that many of the crops, we don't have sufficient data on this. It's not a criticism. It's a fact. Anybody who's doing a fertigation planning, one of the stumble stone or one of the blockade is actually lack of information on particular crop. Now, for example, it, some of them are available. Tandon 1993 and the Indian Fertilizer Association, they have given, for example, cane, if you want to create get 132 tons per hectare, which is a very low yield, actually. We are creating 250 tons per hectare, by the way. We are getting. You need 161 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare. That much has to be removed by the crop, not in the applied. Please understand. This is removed by the crop. Crop has to take it. And potassium 205. This sort of data will guide us to understand the volumes of fertilizer required for a successful high productive crop. That's all it is. But even this, we may not have for all the crops analyzed and then uh, put in the literature. Now, this is a classic diagram of the nutrient absorption found in any crop physiology and even plant physiology books. It has a value, even though it's an old publication. By the way, old sometimes can be most valuable. Here, you look at the uh, crop growth stage, vegetate, just a general thing only, not a specific crop. You have the vegetative growth stage, you have the starting, then vegetative, the flowering, the full protection of the fruits or whatever, grains. Then the harvest happens. So initially less potash, high nitrogen, and then P205, more or less slightly high during the vegetative, then it tapers down. High potassium comes later in the protection, that is the fruit or grain formation time. So this gives us some idea about uh, generally how the crop uptakes nutrient and utilizes during its crop cycle. Now we go both to it using uh, water culture. So it used to be called hydroponics, used to be called uh, liquid culture, water culture one time. Now because commercialized the hydroponics even lost the definition actually. Um, in 1985, this is the data on uh, tomato control condition, that is greenhouse tomato. You see the, uh, here again, 
due towards the harvest we need more or before that is flowering and fruiting time you need more potassium in the system for tomato to form very high yield and quality food later also i will show you this in a different way vegetative stage transplanting stage tomato seedling transplanting stage requirement is less so what happens in a general agriculture conventional agriculture is that either before transplanting or immediately after transplanting we apply masses of fertilizer npk right into the soil the crop is not ready it's exactly like a baby an infant try to be fed with the solid food when it is only two months three months old that situation happens with, with infants we are very careful we are not so careful about our crops so we, we think that it is applied in the soil it is available so it will take whenever it wants it doesn't it fixes it moves with water it goes away from the roots this is the message fertilizer large quantity you apply to the soil irrespective of the time of the crop need is wasted now this is a wonderful study this study is uh, one of the rarest and i was uh, i spent a lot of time locating such a study here you will see the maize growth from the seed planting to final uh, reproductive stage five when the crops are formed and here the days are given how many days each uh, the v e emergent stage v2 is actually two leaf stage v5 vegetative five leaf stage like that that's the way it doesn't matter along with that what is given is the number of days to that stage seven days 20 days 30 days 45 days finally 110 days and beyond 110 days you are harvesting it and here percentage of water taken by the crop that's more important is given okay we are not talking about water today i'm talking about npk so here the npk requirement is given this is a beautiful thing now using this if i am making by the way this study is done in australia for an australian soil please understand now similar study unless you do it for your own soil or your own region this cannot be immediately used but at least it will provide a guidance to a person like me who is preparing fertigation schedules on to introducing and how much to introduce of each nutrient at each stage that's what the purpose of this this sort of studies i tell you when i by the time complete patient presentation you will understand that there are so many fertile areas for research is available students and university professors can work together and get and we have a very very fertile field in fertigation for research for example rice potassium take another one this i actually use it for the rice fertigation schedules which i provide to our farmers drip farmers now look at here about 30 days till tillering the use of potassium is very little, very little. You take percentage of the total. It is less than 25%. But the moment boot stage and flower exertion, flower comes out, and this is happens, and the grain is filling, the milk and the heart and all those stages, you see it goes about to 75, almost 75% uh, of the K is required at that time. It has given total. I use the red line to explain to you. You can have details later. Basically, what happens is that fertigation is a plan where you apply the nutrient only when the crop needs it. In conventional, you apply based on some calendar times recommended by institutions and universities and panjangas and books. You apply. That's a difference. That difference we have to make. And I want to have see these recommendations becoming standardized, tested in Indian soils and used by Indian farmers, then we are all going to do precision farming, maintaining soil health. Now, this is our recommendation, which I have been prepared for a rice farmer. We introduce potash, for example, just to look at the potash only. Between 26 to, that is 30 days growth is over. There, the nitrogen has gone up from 32% to 54%. I started applying a bit of potash, 25%. But maximum potash is coming from 75 days to about 90 days time. So we can, we could make that one. Okay, now you ask me where the scientific basis. Scientific basis is my accumulated knowledge of going through all these things and also my, my knowledge about rice growth. That's what it is required for people to make this sort of thing. Now, 
A lot of people can do. Prophesiology is actually a tool. It's an applied tool where you get all this information you can do. And the literature will give you crop specific information. Now, this is the basis of scheduling. Finding out which nutrient, how much is required at each stage, growth and the developmental stage. Then you can apply according to that. It's fine. You apply in a daily or once in two days. Farmers need not know this background science. Farmers have to be given standardized, ready to apply fertigation schedules in the form of cars. That's what we do in gene irrigation. You can ask the sugarcane farmers of Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh and all that. See that they, they have in their file for that particular crop, fertigation schedules filed by several years back for the crops. Now, this is the to show you the total elements. Now, this is the schedule, the card. Here, very simple. From fertilization day 7, 9, 11, alternate days in this case, how much urea to be applied? How much monoammonium phosphate should be applied? Monoammonium phosphate, because the basal dose is already given while land preparation. Initially, there is no monoammonium phosphate. It starts around the 27th day only. Then uh, it ends around 75th day in the in the slide here. Okay. Then you have, on the other hand, white potash. Rice requires the white potash. You saw that towards the end. You need to apply more and more. It starts around 41st, 45, 41 or 45 days, and it goes till about 97 days for a 110, 115 day crop. So this is what the scheduling. The knowledge which is already available and your experience with the crop and we had to actually visualize if somebody says i want for a very strange crop for example not so common crop in india durian okay i have to know the durian stages of growth and both the dry matter accumulation and then developmental changes when the flower will come when the fruit will come, and how many days the fruit will grow this has to be matched with the fertilizer which uh, this is what it is mean and this is what fertigation schedule in the real sense means and the basis now for sugar cane for example initially the green tower is high in this graph which is nitrogen you need more nitrogen up to about 105 days you see sugar cane has got a story in conventional agriculture many of the sugar cane experts will uh, agree with me now they have, many of them have changed their attitude also, their thinking also. They used to uh, recommend applying for all the fertilizer in the first 90 days. What happens the crop afterwards? That is why they are getting only 20, 20 tons, 22 tons per acre. While my farmer will get 100, kg, 100 tons per, per acre, 75 tons, 80 tons, 100 tons per acre. That I'm making the difference. And he, he believes me now. He also did not believe me originally when I said it. So that's what the material. This is actually by a company called Duplos, which is actually a shoot of offshoot of uh, IFA. They studied this. The uptake, daily uptake rate is only what is shown in this. You see, in the first uh, 31 to 60 days, sugarcane takes up to 1.4 kg per hectare nitrogen. But it hardly takes 0.4 kg of phosphate. But towards the end, you see the long red uh, histogram. Around uh, after about 274 days, when the cane is maturing, the cane is taking 1.4 up to 1.5 kgs of potash per hectare. That's the time it requires because the cane is maturing. Sugar is being loaded to the cane. So that difference is now beautifully you can fertilizing so people who were originally saying 90 days you stop it maximum 120 days i remember my earlier days with the fertigation and my struggle with the people who are actually uh, uh, controlling the farmers they will not allow me to go beyond this even though all the science is there even at that time now they understood most of the farmers under we have so many people who are harvesting 100 tons 80 tons 90 tons per acre not per hectare per acre and this is the major reason for this. So you have sugarcane needs more nitrogen in initial stages and more of potash towards the uh, towards the end. Now that's what the schedule has been formed based on that. 
Now you will see potato. Potato has got several growth stages. You have a sprouting stage, vegetative, tuber initiation, tuber bulking, and maturation. And the schedule has been made based, based on that. And now you have, uh, there's one difference. When you grow a crop open and when you grow the similar species of the crop, I won't say variety, inside a poly house or a greenhouse or a climate control system, you have a difference because tomato open field 80 tons per hectare, but you are producing 100 to 200 tons in a protected cultivation. So your uptake rate also changes. This is beautiful data actually from the uh, Indian Fertilizer Association. It takes uh, instead of 80 to 100 uh, to produce 80 tons, it takes 250, 3.35.1415 K. But to, in the protected cultivation, it is almost 200 to 600, 44, 88 higher quantity because you're making the crop to produce more you need it and also it is in a protected environment in a way of speaking you are making the environment more conducive for its growth not the open uh, compared to the open land so which means it needs more food in gain irrigation we are not only using the literature of the past we do research i personally uh, i do uh, in, get involved in a lot of research in the area of fertigation and some of them are our own some of them in collaboration with the universities for a student to, to get a phd i'll give you some of these examples example here fertigation for a cashew variety vri3 it has the recommended dose is 450 150 and 150 gram per tree per year in tamil nadu now if you look at it is a phd research the research is uh, completed and uh, even with the fertilizer, 75% of the recommended, you produce the highest yield of 900 kilogram per acre of cashew nut. Where do you get that? So here, there is an interesting thing. If you do fertigation properly, there, is a, there was a general feeling that it should reduce the volume of fertilizer you are applying, the quantity of fertilizer you are adding. This is actually happening. This is one example. But I'm not saying that it will happen to every crop. I'll show you contrary to this also. But in cash, it happens. It was 75% of recommended fertilizer in a fertigation gives you 900, but the same fertilizer applied by soil will give you only 250 gram of uh, cashew. By the way, this is a repeated study, two years data. Which means from the recommended, you can reduce the fertilizer by 25%. And solid evidence is there. Now, there is not only that, there are two varieties, another two varieties. Here, the very impressive result in that study has come. The blue histogram shows the yield under fertigation, and the red one yield under normal soil application. See the difference. So, fertigation is impactful. You don't have to apply the wall of the fertilizer recommended, you can still get much higher yield and that is precision farming pomegranate same in pomegranate we when we did this farm this is actually a daily research farm in uh, tamil nadu you see this with the soil application of the full dose of fertilizer you get uh, about um, six tons per hectare just over six tons but with the 50 percent of the fertilizer applied with fertigation, you are getting 18 tons. It's actually harvested. Beautiful result and beautiful information in terms of uh, soil health, in terms of fertilizer economics, in terms of farmers' income. That is why what fertigation does. But you have to painfully conduct experiments and prove this point. Till that time, nobody will believe you. But if you can also increase the fertilizer, see whether it makes any benefit. No, the histograms are smaller. With 100, uh, the full percentage is only 10 tons, 10 or uh, 11 tons it is coming. So, fertilizer, fertigation, when it is done properly in the precision farming, you can reduce the recommended doses of fertilizer. But your schedule has to be perfect. Pomegranate, not only the quantity of pomegranate harvested, look at the aerial quality, aerial, the, the, the pink uh, flesh inside the pomegranate fruit which you eat, that is aerial. The 50 percentage gives you 16 milligram of anthocyanin, the color which gives it in the aerial per 100 gram of uh, aerial. 
while the soil application gives only less than 14. So, which is an important uh, information. You need higher quality. Fertigation helps you in reducing the fertilizer, increasing the yield, and increasing the quality of the poop also. There are many, many win-win situations here. It's not only win, win, win. You can have many wins. Yes, you may think that I'm passionate about fertigation. Yes, I am. You can think that. And that is the way because this is something is a science, and when it is packed into a form of a technology, it should be used by maximum people and then get the benefit. It has a lot of pluses, which we will list later. Now, processing tomato, which is another trial we did with um, the previous two were done with the Tamil Nadu Agriculture University collaboration. Students work with our farm. This is the um, YSR Horticulture University Tadepalli Gudam in Andhra Pradesh. Two, two students work with me and uh, the two types of uh, tomato, Langa and Abina, both are processing tomato. Look at here. Here, there is a difference. The normal recommended fertilizer, which is given, which is um, 150, oh, that is 150, 25, like recommendation. So, what we did was that we took 80 percentage of that, we took 100 percent, we took 120 percent also. Here, the trend is. We are under fertilizing for processing variety. They are profusely flowering, very high yielding ones in the field. So they need more food. They may be getting, because fertilizer studies are not done on those new varieties, they may be getting the recommendation of our old varieties of tomato, which they are using it because nobody nobody went and revised the fertilizer. But like, can, it's just a possibility. So it shows that it needs more. Your yield is still high. See, for example, have now gone up to 140 tons per hectare when the fertilizer is 20% uh, more. So that's also possible. So it is not always pressure less. If a crop is profusely yielding and newer and newer varieties are coming, which has got a higher yield potential, their demand of fertilizer also is more. That's what it is proving. It's not proving anything else. I also, we also looked at the lycopene content, the color, the material which gives the color to your uh, tomato sauce. No, I, I didn't mean the artificial color, the tomato's own color, lycopene, milligram per 100 gram. Look at that. For alencar, it is increasing. For a variety of alencar, the uh, high content, 120 percent, gives, gives you better. But, happy now, if you increase 120 fertilizer, the quality goes down a bit, like what we produce. So these are sort of information we are generating. Now, all this will help in your ultimate planning of fertilizer schedule. That's the point I'm making. Generally speaking, from the conventional to water simple, you increase the efficiency of the fertilizers. Nitrogen goes up to 90, 95, phosphatic to 90, and potassium 90 to 95. It's actually data from some research done in uh, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. I'm just using it to explain the fact that fertilizer use efficiency increases both for, uh, all the elements N, B, and K when you change from the soil application to the fertilizer application through fertilization. You have drip fertigation and on yield enhancement. A lot of fruit crops have. Even all of them have yield increased. Six tons of pomegranate, nine tons on the fifth year, 2.5 tons of mango, 12th year. Here I'm getting for 6.5 tons on the fifth year. That, of course, is just another added technology for dry density. That's a separate thing. But mango yielded faster. Mango yielded more. many crops are here. Now, all this long story which I have been talking to you simply means adoption of fertility would result in high fertilizer use efficiency. That's what we want. Every pie a farmer spend, spends from his pocket, he should get the maximum return. It comes from water use efficiency, it comes from fertilizer use efficiency, it can come from insecticide use efficiency. Or whatever, Efficiency that is what to lead us for safe agriculture production as.
as well as health of people and health of environment and health of soil. The efficiencies would be increased. Now, additionally, it has been experimentally proved that some 20-25% of fertilizer can be saved, which you saw research in pomegranate, cashew, banana, mango, rice, tomato, turmeric, and chili have validated some of these findings. Tomato you saw, there is a variety of different tomato can yield further higher, provided you give more fertilizer. So that's why I'm just summarizing. High yield, lower fertilizer use, and high fertilizer efficiency. That's the key. Now, I'm coming to the reality from the uh, buying around with the science of it. The reality, farmers are finding it difficult to adopt fertigation. And we, our, it's my own observations. Somebody can question me on this. Number one factor is non-availability of water-soluble fertilizers in the rural areas where the farms are. Every farmer cannot go to Hyderabad city or Coimbatore city and buy water. Fertilizer supply has to penetrate into the rural areas, especially fertilized fertilizers. Conventional fertilizer traders, they do not have any knowledge about water soluble fertilizers. I'm not saying that. Many of them don't even know something called water soluble fertilizer is applied, is available. It should be advised to the farmers to use it because many farmers, where do they get the fertilizer recommendation from the trader? Timely supply of these fertilizers are not reaching the farmers. You can't wait. And the fruit is about the boot stage, and the flag leaf has come out. The panicle is coming out, and you can't go around and find out where I can get the water soluble potash. The cost of water soluble that's another major issue. The cost is high because it is not manufactured in India, it is imported, and the import duty is passed on to the to the farming to the farmers. That we all know. And many of the farmers say that you cannot afford. That is one of the reasons when we started fertigation some 20 years back as a major thing. And with the arrival of APMIP, uh, the boosting this, we realized that let us do only urea and uh, potash. Right? Because both are conventional fertilizers available. Do not load the farmer with the burden of going for water soluble fertilizer. But now, people, farmers who understood this, it has a benefit. They go into any extent and buy water soluble fertilizer. That's the beauty about it. So starting trouble, it was there because everybody thought it is too much economic burden. Basically, what is water soluble fertilizers have to be manufactured in India to reduce the the specialty fertilizers are always imported and don't manufacture as well. And another thing, farmers' awareness have to be built in. This, uh, as a company like us, Jane, with our agronomists going and meeting the farmers and our meetings, seminars, and all that. Our reach is limited compared to this vast country and the large uh, millions of uh, farming uh, uh, farmers. So this has to come in some sort of systematic way of teaching. Interestingly, fertigation is as, as a science is not taught as part of agriculture or horticulture courses. Maybe last a few years it might have started. I don't know. In some place, some, some limited universities. Many people do not. Go through this course when they come up they uh, pass bscs and come to uh, come looking for jobs and all that we are teaching them just like we are teaching the farmers so what i'm saying is that this has to become the new normal fertigation all the books on agriculture science in the colleges and the uh, intermediate and all that to be rewritten when it comes to fertilizer management and fertigation, fertigation, fertigation has to be put into that so that it becomes the new normal. People do not think anything other than that. We have to come to that stage. Fertigation results in, is a sort of summary, balanced nutrition, high yield and quality, and income, of course. If for, to some extent, fertilizer saving, Lower soil and water pollution. That's an indirect benefit the society is going to get, the community is going to get, the country is going to get. And it maintains soil health. You are applying what is required. You are not applying extra to lodge into the soil and create crop. This is a sort of summary. Thank you very much. For your attention. I know it was a bit long, but
but it's a science which has come developed over the years so to understand the basics we need time thank you very much